Welcome to Kyra Author Insights. I'm with Dr. Uma Naidu, and you're about to have an incredible experience interviewing with a world leader in a specialized niche. The author of the breakthrough book, This Is Your Brain on Food, an indispensable guide to the surprising foods that fight depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, and more. Dr. Uma is a board certified psychiatrist, also a nutrition specialist, and a trained chef, in fact, a Michelin level chef, which is an incredible achievement. Uh, what is really exciting though, which I think is incredible for us to know, is she's the founder and director of the first hospital-based um, nutritional psychiatry um, area of influence in a person's mental health, which is incredibly epic, and particularly from a chiropractic perspective, people who want to change the health of a person nutritionally, naturally, um, makes you a rock star in my in my opinion and you know the nutritional psychiatry the approach that you take is breakthrough is so important for the health and lives of patients and community and i am incredibly grateful to have you here as we talk about your book today thank you so much for that lovely introduction marcus i i, I really appreciate it i'm happy to share my my insights as i went through this process um and as much as I would love to be a Michelin star chef, it was actually David Boulay who spoke about me, who was the Michelin star chef. I'm a professional chef, but he is a mentor. And, um, and that, that just, just in case people Google that and, and it's not me, but, but thank you. I, I appreciate that, that, uh, that salutation. So I'm going to keep it for now. All right. Well, I, I like to do my research on people and that came up somewhere. So that, that was really interesting that sometimes we don't always hear the truth, but what we do hear is the incredible and story behind people's experiences. And I thank you for correcting me and I'll make sure that we uh, don't share that again, but what it does show and emphasize <laughs> no is problem. the level of people that you're associating with, uh, em emphasize your expertise, what you can draw from in bringing this you know, area of nutritional psychiatry to the world, uh, improving people's mental health, their experience. And, and you come from a place of research and deep clinical knowledge and your expertise within the hospital background as well. And all through, you know, leading to this point of food nutrition to change people's mental health and well-being, and therefore their quality of life. So I'd love to know a little bit more about the book and, you know, what the message of the book is. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I, that's a great question because I, it's something that only when you go through the process as, as you have as well, that you understand the things that perhaps you could have done differently or could, could have known or you wished you had known. Um, my, my book process was somewhat unusual. Uh, uh, and, and that whole uh, part about David Bull, Chef David Boulay, who is a Michelin star chef, I, I should say that one of the times that he and I came together, I was invited to do a program with him uh, that he hosted his restaurant in New York when it's open. And he was a person who kind of, who loves nutrition, who does an immense amount of work. And what I'm saying is relevant to the story. Um, and because he's focused so much on nutrition, he just thought of my credentials in a particular way and paid me a great compliment that, uh, you know, has, has just been used in the media. So that that I understand where you got that from. But it also kind of highlighted for me that um, it, it may have changed a little bit of what I might initially want to have written about. And you'll be surprised to understand that even though I'd been doing this work clinically uh, from pretty early on, even and, and even though the field of nutritional psychiatry is considered nascent, I have been practicing by always counseling my patients about nutrition in relation to lifestyle and mental health as soon as I, I learned how to prescribe in terms of psychotropics, because I felt that there was, even during my training and understanding that there were side effects. So if I was going to do that, um, and I do still prescribe medications, I did want people to understand the breadth of what they could do. As I trained in different areas, just following passion for different things that I did because there's a gap in nutrition in medical school um, and because I loved food. So culinary school came along and these three, th this trifecta came together organically. Uh, I, I wish I could say that I invented it, but I didn't. I, I did different things, but they really came together and I felt feel very blessed and very fortunate for that. But the, 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 the point was trying to make is that, you know, the work had been going on and maybe it just wasn't called that. I recall very early on in my practice, 
and I speak about this in my book, um, a patient came in and was kind of upset with me at my community clinic. And I was, a, you know, I was pretty, uh, pretty junior at that point. And I was, you know, prescribing uh, an SSRI medication for him. And he accused me of, you know, making him gain weight. And it was a very short time since I had started the medication. So it was, maybe it was possible, but not likely. But he also brought in a very large cup of coffee with him. And in Boston, in the Boston area, we have a favorite coffee called Dunkin' Donuts. It's, it, it started in, in the Massachusetts area. 20 ounces is a, is a pretty large size cup of coffee. And I said, oh, gee, you know, let's call him David. I said, gee, David, you know, how, what did you put in your coffee today? I, I, I was partly trying to distract him because he was upset, but I also, it occurred to me, gee, he's probably, what is he drinking in that coffee? So when we broke it down and we calculated it online together, he was putting more than a quarter cup of cream and about eight sugars. And when nutritionally, we, we expect, because you don't realize when it's that big, right? How many sugars are going in or how many packets as they use them here. So when I broke that down for him and we talked about the calories and I said, well, here's something we can do together. And we kind of aligned around, these are tweaks you can make even if you have to take this medication. Something for me really kicked in, in terms of that was a real example of how someone could understand it. So I, as a doctor, need to be more educated on the nutritional side. And I've been interested in nutrition from young, from early, early on in my life, but I really want to to know more and integrate it with this area of how people were starting to think and what lifestyle changes they could make. And, you know, as these pieces came together, um, when I left culinary school and, and I, 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 you know, did well in culinary school, I thought, you know, I should write a cookbook. And, and here lies, lies, the, uh, lies the joke. So, you know, I would have been thinking, well, you know, I should write about all these delicious recipes that I've learned. I love food and I know a little bit about all of this nutrition stuff. But really, the way that the book came to be was that I was blogging for different sites, one of them being Harvard Health Publications. And, you know, I guess when you're online and, you, and you're writing blogs in this area, different bloggers or different media reach out to you. And a couple of media sites reached out to me and a few blogs that I wrote got, I, I suppose the word is they went viral because whatever the content was seemed to interest people. And one of the things that happened from there was that I got introduced to Chef Boulet. Uh, we began working and collaborating together, but also it was really because those articles seemed to spark interest. And one was about anxiety and how, you know, I had a patient who had struggled to, she was trying to cut back on sugar and did it suddenly. And when she did it suddenly, she actually presented with anxiety and panic in my office. And that was how I met her. But as I traced back what had happened, she hadn't had any type of anxiety before. She, you know, she, she didn't have perfect mental health, but she wasn't struggling. And she had done this phase suddenly. And, be, and I guess the way that we wrote about this in the blog is that we, we kind of unpacked it for people and explained that, you, sh you know, you should cut back on sugar, but if you do it overnight, your body is used to this amount of sugar load from candy, chocolates, cookies, whatever it is you're eating, soda, the next day it has none and your body is kind of searching for it. And so I suppose the way that that was written by, it was written, it seemed to spark a lot of interest. A couple of those went viral and it led to someone reaching out to me on LinkedIn and saying, I really think you should write a book. And this was uh, a person who was an agent. Um, it wasn't the agent that I ended up with, but it, it kind of got the idea born in my head because at that point I was working clinically, <clears throat> working in my clinic, doing the work that I do, but it didn't occur to me that, oh, there's a book here. Um, <clears throat> and again, I would have thought it was a cookbook, but, but that's how it came to be. And then I, I, I started to explore the opportunity and was connected um, by my husband to uh, two different agents and, and work, decided to work with one where there was a real connection. And I also felt that they helped me understand where the depth of this book lay having heard my clinical work and what I was doing. Whereas I walked in thinking, well, I, you know, I'm a chef and I did all this cool, you know, these cool, I know all these cool recipes and I should write a cookbook. But, you know, this is where great mentorship and a great team help you because it went from 
you don't, you're not seeing that the work that you're blogging about and the work that you're doing is so extremely valuable to people. And it wasn't that I didn't understand the value. For me, it was what I do. And I didn't necessarily think that it should be in a book. Uh, it was very much just my clinical work. But that, re that really helped us focus the book. So one of the things I would share about this with people is when you meet the right agent and you get connected to the right people, you will know that they will help you flesh out your idea. And I think that they're very talented at that, like you are talented in your clinical work and your practice and what you're an expert at, they have their expertise and that coming together can be very useful to craft the idea of the book. Um, and, and for me, that was a huge moment because I understood that that was important and, and that's how we proceeded down writing the book on nutritional psychiatry. Brilliant. And that's, that's a great story. It's a really important message for, for the viewers, for the listeners, because we, we have our expertise, we have our knowledge, and we, and we sometimes perceive and limit it to the practice itself. But when we nuance it in a certain way, we have the opportunity to, to find a niche for it and therefore an opportunity to share, um, put that message out to a, a wider, broader audience and therefore create a great impact. So um, and that's, you know, that's what's happening with you in terms of the opportunity that's coming out of the, the book. Uh, the, the, the book is going to do incredible because it holds hold such an important message. And it doesn't always flow a linear process of what you expect, but it does allow for opportunities to unfold that may not otherwise have occurred. And I just think it's an incredible insight for people to hear and therefore, you know, take action on. I do want to just get a little bit more about the message of the book, though, because I know that the subtitle says so much. An indispensable guide for surprising food, and I love that use of the word surprising foods because you know we all know that we should eat and we should eat well and we should eat right. fresh fruit and vegetables. In Australia, they talk about the five two all the time. You know, five serves mm -hmm. of vegetable, two serves of fruit. But there are certain surprising food that alter our brain chemistry, our mm -hmm. nervous system function can help in terms of depression, anxiety, and a lot of the other mental health challenges. Talk about your expertise and experience in the neuroscience and mental health and psychiatry mm -hmm. area based on your food mm -hmm. experience. Sure. So, you know, um, part of the uh, part of what was developing, as I described, was that I was exploring more nutrition and I decided, well, I, I have to fill this gap for myself. Um, and so I studied I studied nutrition and I, I understood uh, the, the greater depth of what what food on a plate is it's 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 the nutrients and what it it, it it helps to sort of understand some of the nutritional science behind it because it can be very confusing when patients or, or people read things in the media and read headlines which you know sometimes are sensationalized but with not with without the most accurate nutritional advice for people so they take away from that um you know, I should go back to eat, uh, eating red meat every day and, and um, salami is back and all sorts of things. It was actually uh, a, st um, a study that came out from, from, I think, from the annals. And this was in fall of last year here, which, which did convey such a message. And, and there was a lot of hubbub about it. But the reason I say that is people don't often know coming into your office, in my case, with mental health issues, um, how they should eat and if they're guided by what they see online they don't always know how to interpret that information so as we went through the when i went through the process of doing this you know working in my clinic i started to look up all of the research and that's how we understood that there was a significant body of research behind the book but I, I want to preface this by saying that nutritional epidemiology and nutritional science studies are very difficult to do. And when they have smaller numbers of people involved, of human subjects, it doesn't make them less powerful. I, I think that people often will look at it and roll their eyes and say, oh, it's only so-and-so number of people. But these are not studies that are funded like pharmaceutical studies are. There isn't that type of backing behind them. So we have to interpret them for the quality of the data presented. And I think that's important for people to understand. The second thing is that animal studies should not be excluded, meaning you don't, it, it doesn't necessarily give you an exact example of what will happen in a human being, but it guides you. I mean, 
the, some some animal studies that are done particularly well, especially around the gut microbiome, and they give us immense amount of information. So I don't discount that in terms of my understanding of the nutritional science. I'm not saying it applies to every human, but it, but it helps to educate me. And the other part I would say is that what, what I did is I looked at about 700 references. We condensed this down to 550, just about 550 in the book. And we divided it up into, that's, that's the subtitle, we divided it up into the most important, um, uh, you know, elements of, of sort of mental illness and foods that people should embrace. So there's a food list in every chapter. And then the chapter 11 is recipes and the recipes match the chapters and then foods people should avoid. Because I think that the, the surprising thing is that there are many things people eat and they don't understand you know, they might think, look, a few candy bars a week or a day um, and, and some soda doesn't matter. But when you know that the glucose level has been shown in studies to affect, you know, BDNF, which is um, a brain derived neurotropic factor and its levels, and it impacts that. And studies have shown that it's lower when people's glucose levels are higher. You understand, well, gee, you know, if I'm just eating sugar every day, um, or three cans of soda a day, whatever, whatever it is that, you know, everyone has to start somewhere. So this is not judgment. It's just, if you're doing that, there's information you need to look at. So I, I think that people also found foods that they should avoid extremely important um, because what it did is explain to them how it affects their brain and therefore their mental health. They might've known, oh, I might, I might gain some weight or I might, you know, feel a certain way. The, the other part is that um, there, there were some surprising foods that we came, that we, we came across, you know, we, things, for, for example, chickpeas actually contain a significant amount of tryptophan. Um, so when you need to, you know, transport tryptophan back to the brain to help build up on levels of serotonin and, and melatonin and things like that, whether it's sleep or depression or whatever you're, you're, you're targeting, one way to do that is to include chickpeas in your diet. Uh, you know, and they, the caveat with it is that it's transported better because it's helped by uh, carbohydrates. So, you know, the joke I make with people is you always hear about tryptophan and turkey and th Thanksgiving here, but it might be the mashed potatoes that are actually helping you get that, that, that good feeling uh, related to the serotonin. So, it's, so these little things behind the understanding the nutrition that really helped us um, kind of, you know, come up with, come up with some surprises. Well, I love, I love the insights that you're bringing forth there. And something that you said, I mean, there's, there's an amazing understanding that you, you, you're sharing with us there, but something you said was the confusion in the marketplace can be clarified by the message that you deliver. So there are so many thoughts out there. There are so many people saying, eat this or don't eat that. And yet when it's not research founded, when it doesn't come from an expert with their clinical understanding, their research and also their, their background, uh, the, the message can be, there can be so many messages and not all of them are accurate, not all of them are unnecessarily true and not all of them will produce positive or meaningful outcomes. So right. by you willing to share your message, you offer clarity to an uncertain and confused marketplace that are looking for an answer that don't yet have a solution. So your willingness to express your voice into that arena actually is such an important action because it brings that clarity, that certainty, that confidence and the impact because of the authority that you bring via your position. So that's, I, I just thought, as you were speaking about that, the importance of experts to speak into the market is so important because there is such a lot of confusion. And you know that's exactly what your book does. It really cuts through the darkness and, and shares the light of, of truth of both the research. And again, I'm coming from a, a chiropractic perspective here. Mm -hmm. We know that the brain governs and controls all function in the body, including mood, including emotional, mental and well-being. Uh, emotional health and mental well-being but it also changes the physiological functions of of your organs and your ability to perform peak levels so you are introducing a phenomenon that is absolutely necessary into a market that is getting misrepresentation and misinformation and so it's a timely message an important message and a valuable message so thank you for it firstly for writing the book and then also for being willing to share that message and, and get on you know, Zoom calls such as this and, and other events because it's such an, a time and an important factor. Thank you. I, I certainly hope so. And, you know, I think, I think you raise um, 
you raise a, a really important fact, which made me think more about um, how to sometimes frame this information, especially when individuals come into my office and they quote articles or they quote Time magazine, they quote a really, you know, valuable uh, media that that we respect and but but sometimes the nutrition is is a little bit you know the the, the message is a little bit um it, it isn't what i would want my patients to be eating let me put it to you that way but here's the thing about nutritional science and even the nutritional epidemiology on any given day you could say you know you should eat that and there will still be a study that i can find that will say you really shouldn't be eating x because it does A, B, C, and D. And I think part of what we try to unpack in the book, I'm using the royal we, but what I try to unpack in the book is, is really, this is what the research shows. These are the things that you should embrace in terms of food. And these are the things you actually should stay away from. Um, you know, does it mean that, that every single study says that you shouldn't have stevia? No. A little bit of stevia is fine. I've said throughout the book, in moderation, um, even if it's a food that you like, even if it's a, a beer or, or alcohol, in moderation with these guidelines, um, you know, and 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 definitely enjoy the things that you that you do love, but do it in a contained way. You know, name a treat day for the week. Um, treat because it it positively frames that for someone rather than cheat day, which makes them feel bad and have that, you know, and, and then move on from it. Because, because the research changes all the time, but there are some tenants that we know. You know, you mentioned fruits and vegetables, we know this, and we know that you can't get fiber from animal sources. So plant fiber and, and fiber from fruit, beans, nuts, legumes, and seeds is vital for gut bacteria. They, it's vital to help them thrive and to produce the, um, uh, produce the substances that are going to help us, like the short chain fatty acids. So it's, you know, sometimes when, when, when uh, all types of doctors say, you know, Phew, you should eat your fruits and vegetables, clients can sometimes roll their eyes and be like, every doctor tells me the same. But when you actually tell them why it's important, you know, these are low calorie foods that you can get tons of vitamins, nutrients from, but also fiber, you know, it just, it, it helps to make the link a little bit more because, because of every study that we quote, there'll be another study that will, that will disprove it. But it's about interpreting what's, be, what's, what's better and what's safer for someone to do um, on any given day and what you, will improve their health and their mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And you have the opportunity, not only have done the research there, but you also bring that into a clinical setting, particularly a mental health clinical setting through psychiatry. So you, actually get to see the evidence does food alter brain function, mental health and a person's okay. well-being, not just does it change their weight or their immune system or their energy levels. It's actually, in this case, a, a neuroscience phenomena, a brain health matter. And you're able to say the research not only correlates with what we um, see experientially, but it has these positive outcomes that drive the results that people are looking for, which instead of having, you know, anxiety and depression is having a sense of positiveness and certainty and confidence and belief and happiness. Instead of having PTSD or OCD, they're able to manage their state, their mental functions. And so your approach, instead of being psychotropic, being um, nutritional, is evidence clinically but scientifically supported, which is such a profound way to look at brain health and impact a person's well-being, overall well-being, as well as their psychological and psychiatric well-being. So I think it's a profound approach you've taken, and so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. So I'd like to bring this to conclusion with just a, a, a really a simple thought from you. And when I say simple, it's not necessarily a, an easy process to come up with this, but what has it meant for you to write a book? It's it's you know it's a it's a journey to, from beginning to end from you know everything that you've shared so far. But have that getting that book in your hand. You, you pick up a book. I don't have one immediately near me. You pick up your book. You've written this. You put your your heart into it. How did it make you feel when you when you got your your first copy back and you flicked through those pages? It's uh, it, it was. I have to tell you, it was um, it was a it was a beautiful feeling. It was. Uh, it was a feeling of joy. It was a feeling of gratitude that I had the opportunity to bring forth my message because the background is that, you know, I'm kind of a shy person. 
I'm a pretty quiet person and uh, I'm not the lively one in the family. And so my message and all these different things that I shared so openly today are not things that, you know, my friends knew that I did these things and my colleagues knew, but I'm not, I wasn't necessarily someone who was on social media, you know, even sharing my cooking and my dishes and things like that. Um, so this has been a very, um, probably in some ways developmentally, I mean, I, I am a psychiatrist, so I think about these things. I think developmentally a very, very important um, part of my my uh, growth as a human being to move from being a more shy person about what I was doing to really almost pushing me forward and saying share this message with the world because uh, perhaps someone would find it valuable and and I think that was what came together when I touched the book not only the joy and the gratitude for having that experience but wow you know now I can share this and, and um, cool people and smart people like yourself, if they appreciate it, then that brings me greater joy. So it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great moment. Thank you, for, thank you. Thank you for asking me. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think it, it is such an, I, I love that story. It's a beautiful message to share that, you know, we, we do have this wonderful um, self-reference that allows us to, to reflect at times on, on the significant achievements of our life and writing a book is one of those because it is going to have an incredible impact in people's lives. It's a representation of our own journey and our own mission and our willingness to share a message. And, uh, you have done that elegantly and beautifully. And um, I'm just so grateful for the fact that there are, you know, there are particularly um, in, in the area of psychiatry where there are so many um, medication focused directives that you are a, uh, are bringing a, not just a breath of fresh air, but an incredible breakthrough uh, in a field that needs uh, the message that you have. So, Dr. Uma, you are an incredible servant of the health and lives of the of the community of people who, who are challenged with mental health issues. And you are going to make the, an impact not only in their lives, but in the health and lives of people wanting to improve their, their mental function and their clarity. So thank you for your message. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate you being with us. And I look forward to speaking with you again on the Neuroscience Summit forward to also getting a copy of the book and really digging deep into that and learning its message as well. Thank you so much for your kind words and, and for, you know, for the appreciation of the book. I, I, I'm deeply grateful for that and, and for sharing my message. It was fun to actually uh, think about that a little bit and, and share it with people whom, who may be on this journey at different phases and hopefully will find it helpful. And thank you for your time. Thank you and take care and I wish the book all the success. Thank you. Take care.